everybody. I will call the uh, special meeting of the public hearing for finding a local necessity to order on Tuesday, July 2nd for the Village Trustees. Uh, so I'll call the meeting to order. And I understand in front of us we have a uh, motion to where was this? A motion to continue from a Mr. Speary. That we have that in front of us. Um, Mr. Speary, are you here? I'm here on behalf of Mark Sperry. I'm an attorney at the Mark Sperry and Wolves, along, uh, along with, with Mark Sperry. Okay, great. Um, before I ask you, actually, before I ask you and everybody else in the audience about any questions or anything like that, uh, I would like to ask that since this is a public hearing and we will be accepting evidence and uh, testimony, that if everybody will be able to raise their right hand and uh, repeat a phrase after me, that would be greatly appreciated. So if you all will do me, if anybody is anticipating to speak tonight, or provide any testimony, please do raise your right hand and repeat after me. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Great, thank you. I will ask you if you have done that before you speak tonight. Um, so thank you uh, for being here. And so again, I saw that you did give the, uh, the oath, if you will. So with that, is there anything in addition to what we have in front of us that you would like to comment on with um, regard to this motion? We would just renew the motion. The um, notice is insufficient on, co on constitutional grounds because we can't tell with sufficient certainty what's being taken and what the proposed project actually does to uh, Mr. Kalanji's property. Uh, the site plan uh, was not included along with the notice of hearing um, and it's inconsistent with prior site plans so there's really uh, a, a serious difficulty uh, with assessing both the necessity which we challenge and the damages as to Mr. Kalanji's property so we would renew that motion and we would uh, assert that this hearing is, is without jurisdiction without proper notice. Okay. Is there anything else? That's it, thank you. Okay, great. Um, and so from staff, uh, Mr. Pierce, I saw that you also raised your hand with the oath. Is there uh, anything you would like to rebut? Uh, the notice was, notices were sent out May 24th. Uh, notice of the hearing was in the Essex Reporter, June 6th. And we believe that all the state statutes that uh, had to be adhered to were adhered to. Okay. Um, with regards to some of the things that were brought up about what is being taken, the uh, impact on the property. Well, there's an improvement to all the properties that the road goes through. Uh, no buildings are being taken. We're actually, the vast majority of the road on the east side of the tracks is following the line of an existing dragway until and it needs to cross the tracks. And so all of these were things that were included within notices, within meetings? Yes. It, what was, it's what was called um, Alternate 1 in the scoping study that was approved by the trustees in 2011. And it shifted very slightly since then, but actually it's slightly away from some of the properties, not towards them. Trustees, do either of you have any questions? <coughs> and in terms of other notices, public notices, Robin, uh, public notices in, in newspapers and other local media, was that all taken care of? Yeah, the trustees had two meetings uh, to approve the scoping study, uh, first February and then March, I think that was 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, then the connector road was put into the circle alternative mm -hmm. uh, review. There were 13 warned public hearings for that. Okay. 13 warned public hearings? Yes. And then in terms of this, this particular hearing to, uh, tonight, this evening, uh, was this adequately warned? When, when was this warned? We believe so. Um, the letters are like May 24th, and it was in Essex reported June 6th. Okay, thank you. Nothing for me. Okay. Um, and so with the site plan, was that something that was included? Yes. With within notification to? Uh, it was always included in the, the Radigway packet of trials. And something that was provided to uh, the um, to either the attorney and or to the property owner? Yes. Okay. Um, my other question for, uh, for, my only question for Claude Dean, if I may. Yeah. One of the comments that was made about not having jurisdiction. 
Can you confirm we have, can you tell us if we have jurisdiction? So I think if the, so the, I think the trustees need to assess whether they feel that there was appropriate notice given to the parties. And so if you're, however you decide on that issue, if you decide that there was appropriate notice, then there would be jurisdiction for the board to entertain, um, to continue with the hearing as scheduled. If you felt that there was not, the statutory procedures were not followed, then that would divest the trustees of, of jurisdiction. If I may add to the record. Yeah, hang on one moment, I'll make sure that you have that chance. I just want to make sure that I take notes too. Yeah. So seeing that trustees have no other questions of the, the witness at this point, um, if there's something, if there's a, a rebuttal or another question that you have, yes. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to add that I, the fact that it may or may not be the same as an earlier site plan doesn't create compliance with the notice requirement. Uh, the fact that there is, in fact, an inconsistency leaves a uh, question up to the landowner as well as to us to properly assess what it is that's being proposed, what it is that's being proposed to be taken, and the impact on the property owners. Uh, furthermore, the notice itself said merely a road, not the width, not the location in particular. The notice didn't come with a site plan. We, in fact, had to pursue it later. Um, and so there really hasn't been sufficient notice to the landowner. The uh, site plan, as well as the um, alternate one, I believe, was referenced, they are substantially different. Um, we, there are additions to uh, a driveway as, as well as a parking area. Um, there is presumably a different impact on the overall arc and scope of the project vis-a-vis -vis the impact um, on Mr. Kalanji's and um, the difference is difficult to assess with the information that we have available to us. Eliza Van Lepp. I can leave my card with the board if you'd like. <laughs> did you sign in? I did. Okay. Yes, thanks. thanks. And along with that, for anybody else in the public, if you have not yet signed in, please do so, because that would be greatly appreciated and helpful to us later on. Um, so, uh, Mr. Pierce, I may come back to you again. Uh, with regards to differences from alternate one to what was finally approved, how were the ways in which, what were the ways in which the well, landowner was notified? Alternative one was a schematic, and what it showed was the road on the outside curve, curve moving in more eastwards than it does currently. When we finally did design development, we took that eastward movement of the road out and just joined the curve up. And so how, how would uh, the property owner be notified of that? Well, the plans that went to the property owner had to change. Mm -hmm. What the alignment you have now are the plans that went to the property owner, oh, at least two, two occasions. Okay. Once when we had the appraisal done, mm -hmm. and then when it was noticed, we were plans sent. Okay. Thank you. And the trustees have any other questions? Um, I don't have any further questions. Um, I would say that I think that all the, uh, as far as I can tell from everything I've seen, all the statutory requirements have been met. And I would uh, make a motion at this point to deny uh, the motion to uh, continue from Attorney Sperry. Yeah. I will second that. Okay, so with a motion on the table, uh, is there any other questions from the trustees on the motion? No. Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So at this time, what we will do is we will uh, have an examination of the premises. This will include a site visit. To do so, we are going to need to leave this room and go on a little walking tour of the properties uh, that we are talking about and of the road that is being proposed. Um, so as such, we will vacate the room, um, and then we will come back at the end of the, end of the tour. So that gives you a sense of the road. There are 11 foot lanes with bike lanes on either side, and the eastern side also has a sidewalk with this, with this small uh, green strip. So the yellow paint here is the center of, going to be the center of the yes. road?
this yellow paint you're walking to right now. Yes. Right. Okay. About it. Every, Every hundred feet. It's smart. The neon. Three. The neon yellow, not the the garden variety <laughs> yellow. Not the orangish yellow with the arrows. Right. And from here, curve it the is stick. Through the stick. So you can okay. see from here, it curves over to the stick, just on the grass. How wide are the lanes? 11 foot. 11 feet. Here in the weeds, that's where the center line of the road is, as it crosses the tracks. And then from there, straight across? Straight across. Yep, straight across. There, it mirrors the uh, or mimics the line of the railroad curve pretty much, more or less. Okay, uh, could, you could you come down here? So, we what are the what are the boundaries that are impacted here in terms of railroad and other properties? The railway, we were fine with the road. Mm -hmm and Bill's property to this side, but that's it. If there's a parking area on the map, where would that be vis-a-vis -vis the open space? The parking area is on the railroad uh, right-of-way. Okay. It's uh, something they gave us to offset parking they took away up there. And the, the, the driveway that is on the map, where is that located? It's located approximately where... And where is the curbing located? The curbing is on on all uh, exterior boundaries of the roadway. Yeah, uh, the two exterior boundaries where the where the uh, bike lanes stop. Is there a uh, traffic management plan for the dr for the driveway that's planned for this area during construction? Uh, for the permanent use of the property. I mean, in terms of stop signs. And uh, Required lanes, stop signs, what the, yeah, the turning whole, radius is. Yeah, yeah. So the, I mean, this is a federal project that has to meet federal MUTC. regulations in terms of design mm -hmm. and construction. So we want to kind of reserve questions for when we get back so that we don't have testimony going on on the site walk. It should just be for pointing out where we are and you know, we reserve cross examination for. I'm not actually, I'm not actually intending on testimony. Testifying, we legitimately don't know vis-a-vis -vis the property where the expectation is, is for like where the lanes are going to go, how far out into the property they're going to extend. So I'm not trying to te like testify or be a part of the record. I just I'm actually wondering. Yeah, no, I think if you have <laughs> like questions as to where things are on yeah. the ground, I think to the to the extent that they can best answer it, yeah. I think we should just be pointing things out. But in terms of like any cross examination of Mr. Pierce or anyone else, I just want to reserve that for back at the. And back at town hall. And I think it's helpful to uh, Rick Hamlin. So it's helpful to understand that Mr. Kalanji's property essentially runs along the edge of the pavement. Right now we're standing on railroad property and when we show the plans you'll see uh, the different segments of the right of way um, and how the roadway alignment will be. So we'll, we'll actually show that graphically to you. But Mr. Kalanji's property essentially ends at the, yeah. the limit between the grass and the pavement. Yeah, it's a very so good we're, approximation. We're railroad to side and as soon as we start on the pavement um, we're essentially on Mr. Kalanji's property and, and the impact so then is from that edge of grass and then as we move toward Maple Street uh, Mr. Knox's parcel runs right along the side of the garage closest to us and so that's where uh, the impact to Mr. Kalanji's property will terminate and we'll we'll point that out but just so you can visualize when we have the plan up uh, the grass and pavement is that edge between railway and, and Mr. Kalanji's um, the proposed parking that is on railroad, actually on railroad land, is approximately where that van and trailer is. Uh, Mr. Kalanji's has requested his curb cut to be approximately here, um, and we'll show that on the on the plans. And again, um, uh, we'll, we'll, we can uh, show you the full diagram uh, inside. Uh, so that the area that we're impacting is the pavement, uh, the uh, uh, trailer are, mm -hmm. um, and I'll point out when we get in where the parking is in relationship to that location. Okay. Just look at that, and then again, uh, as we walk forward, uh, pay attention to the the barrier, the difference, the transition between the grass and the pavement. Uh, that's as we walk off railroad lands and onto Mr. Clanges.
And so from that stake to the other stake that we were at before, it's essentially a straight line from stake to stake, 11 feet. No, no, it's, gonna curve. no it's, it's, curve. it's 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 a curve, and we'll, we'll again, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll show we'll that. that. Um, the, the majority of that curve is actually here on the railroad property, and mm -hmm. as we get on to Mr. Clancy's property, we tend to straighten out and onto the alignment of the existing driveway uh, to the intersection with Railroad Street. Okay. Thank you. That stake that we were just at, uh, the center line comes through, and then the center line goes through the bright yellow mark just, just off to the, the edge right of the, of the pavement, grass. Yeah. Just to the right of that utility pole. And about where the arrows are is approximately where Mr. Knox and Mr. Kalanji share that common property line. So again, our impact. So um, the, the railroad right of way actually is right about where I'm standing. The railroad right of way passes just past the end of the red building that you see uh, behind you. So right now I'm on railroad uh, right of way land and now I'm on Mr. Kalanji's property. So that if, again, if the trustees would just look at that building and see that alignment, we can point that out when we're looking at the plan. So you'll note the spaces that we're standing on here are actually on, on the railroad side of the, of the land. Thank you. Be uh, an additional 20 parking spaces, uh, public parking spaces inside this hook of the, of the, so if you look here, this is where those parking spaces will go and we'll point those out to you on a site plan uh, during the hearing. An additional 20, 20 parking spaces right here. That's yes. correct. Again, public spaces, uh, open to all. Uh, the limit between Mr. Knox's parcel and Mr. Kalanji's parcel is here. It runs roughly within a few feet of the edge of this garage. So if you stand here and look down and look back. So when we stood back, I was telling you that it was the verge of the grass and pavement. Well, it's really the edge of this pavement as I'm standing straight back to the red building. The limit of Mr. Kalanji's property, and and we'll show that uh, in a plan plan view. But this edge of pavement projected to the red building, to the right of it, railroad lands to the left, Mr. Kalanji's, and if I put my arm back over here, this is Mr. Knox. The, the next thing I'd like the trustees to note, if they would, is that from this point, the Crescent Connector continues along the alignment of Railroad Street. crosses the tracks, comes to here, and then continues on to uh, Main Street along the alignment of Railroad Street. And I, and I just ask you to take a look at this view right now um, with the two lanes and parking, because there'll be some discussion about that uh, during the presentation, uh, what that configuration looks like now and what it'll look like um, and how the ownership changes after uh, uh, construction. So just want you to look at that and we'll come back. Okay, so we are back. Thank you everybody for the tour. Thank you to everybody who helped to provide the answers to those questions that we had out on the site visit. Uh, we shall move on to uh, the portion of the public hearing 4A where presentations and, and testimony by staff and engineers. Uh, are we having an engineering presentation first? Yes. So if those doing the presentation would like to come up and remind you that you did take the, the oath earlier, and you can come up to the... Oh, not the board, or...? Uh, no, I just, I'll need access to the screen, so if you can go around down there, so I'll go wherever you would like. I just want you in front of a mic. That's fine. Um, let's do this. I may not. join you. Yeah. And once you are all... Settled. If you could also just identify yourself for everybody else who Absolutely. hasn't had the sure. uh, I've already hit myself three times. I would <laughs> come up from the learn today. Who's standing on him? Watch, just look to your, watch your head, Ralph. Stacy. It's usually me that's almost getting killed by him. Even Ramona. That's your pleasure, Mr. President. When you're ready. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Hamlin. So I'll, I'll move around a little bit, but I'll, I'll stay seated for the, the moment. 
Um, my name is Richard Hamlin. I'm a. Well, then we don't get one. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> let me let me know when you're ready. We're ready. Okay. I think we're good. We're good. All right. Thank you. My name is Richard Hamlin. I'm a professional engineer. I'm also the village engineer. And tonight, uh, my capacity is the, <coughs> the project manager for the Crescent Connector project. So our, our goal this evening is to hold a necessity hearing. Um, and uh, with me this evening um, in the audience, uh, obviously, the project design team includes um, Mr. Robin Pierce, um, myself, uh, John Benson. John, would you raise your hand? Um, from Dubois and King, Brian Breslin. Uh, we've got Corey Mack from RSG. We have Andy DeFords, the VTrans project supervisor. And Rob White, also from VTrans, has joined us. Thank you, Rob. Um, so these are the folks that have been working on this project for many years uh, now. So the next slide is just an overview. Um, we, we just walked for your orientation, um, we just walked from the Lincoln Inn, or from the Lincoln offices, on this offices on Lincoln Street here, we crossed the five corners, we came down, walked into the parking lot here, and retraced our steps. So here's the five corners. We'll be discussing Main Street, Lincoln Street, Pearl Street, Park Street, and Maple Street this evening um, as we cover the gamut and information related to uh, the Crescent Connector project. The set of rules that we're working under this evening uh, for this necessity hearing can be found in Title 19 of uh, the Vermont Statutes uh, Highways. Um, and uh, so all of the process steps uh, that, that are to be followed um, come out of that uh, statute, the Title 19. So, what we'll be asking you, the trustees, uh, to do are defined on three things related to necessity. And the statute is, is clear uh, that there are three things uh, that you need to find uh, have a positive impact on the population of this community. One is public good, the other is necessity, and the third is convenience. And so throughout the presentation tonight, uh, if you could just kind of keep those three things, public good, necessity, and convenience in mind, it would be very helpful. And there'll be a couple points we'll, where we'll remind you of, of those as we, uh, as we move through the presentation. Can everybody see everything all set? Everybody good? All right. So first, a little bit of history. Um, the project, the Crescent Connector project, um, has got a fairly lengthy history. And one of the first landmark elements um, that pushed the project from a, a concept into, uh, into motion in terms of the process of moving forward and ultimately having a design was the completion of a scoping study. And that scoping study was prepared by the CCMPO, the Chinon County Municipal Planning Organization. And that was uh, presented and completed in 2011. Um, so, um, and that <coughs> report was uh, presented publicly um, and uh, comments were um, uh, uh, requested from the public and, and uh, received. So in the beginning, uh, there were essentially two routes that the scoping study identified as potential routes for the Crescent Connector, the southern alignment and the northern alignment. So uh, ignore the red outline, uh, which is the study area of the phase A of the Crescent Connector. But there's a dark blue line and a light blue line. And so the light blue line represents a southern alignment, and the dark blue represents the northern alignment. So alternate one, also known as alternate one, and alternate two. The northern alignment, uh, alternate one, ultimately um, selected, goes through the parking lot uh, and just adjacent to the railroad tracks off Route 2A through the McEwen land holding crosses the tracks into the railroad property, then into Mr. Kalanji's property, Mr. Knox's property, then on toward Railroad Street. And so the area that we were walking on Mr. Kalanji's property was right in here, right in this area. So southern alignment, northern alignment, alternate one, alternate two, and those phrases will come up um, another couple times in the, in the report. 
in the presentation. So um, based on input from the residents, um, and especially, especially the impacted landowners, what was selected was alternate one. Two of the landowners felt alternate one uh, was a better choice. One of the land landowners felt alternate two was the better choice. And ultimately, for many reasons, alternate one was selected. So that's a little bit of background. So when you hear about alternate one, alternate two, alternate one is that blue, is that blue route, the ultimately, the ultimate selected route, concept route for the Crescent Connector. So uh, in March of 2011, um, those alternatives were presented. Um, and here is uh, the minutes of the trustees meeting, and I won't read through it. Um, but in this meeting, uh, you, the trustees, um, reviewed and made a motion to accept uh, alternate one as the proposed and accepted route. Um, and so again, that was all done through a couple of public meetings, ultimately with your action to accept alternate one. So after that, um, the project moved forward after the scoping study. The next phase in headed toward design is the preparation of an environmental assessment. Um, and so the environmental assessment, yeah, so, so first, uh, Mr. Benson's going to set on the table right here the scoping study, which we'll offer into evidence. Uh, for tonight's hearing. And then right behind that, he'll offer um, the environmental assessment um, into evidence. So those are for your uh, future reading. Um, again, the EA was presented to the public. The EA was available for public comment, and public comment uh, was, in fact, received. The EA is a very comprehensive document and reviewed many, many different elements of the Crescent Connector and how they might impact traffic, air quality, noise, socioeconomic impact, um, historic impact, uh, hazardous material impacts. Um, so it's a very comprehensive report. And the ultimate goal of the EA process is to get a letter of finding of no significant impact. And so um, in order for a project to continue, uh, uh, this letter of uh, uh, finding of no significant impact, also known as a FONSI, um, needed to be issued. And so um, in 2014, um, the EA was presented to the public. Um, again, comments were received. And ultimately, after that process was complete, uh, the FONSI, uh, or finding of no significant <coughs> impact, uh, was issued um, by the Federal Highway Administration. So that uh, brought us a, a significant hurdle. And again, we're offering that letter into evidence this evening. Uh, that passed a significant hurdle that allowed the project to move into uh, a design phase. So oh, yes. So um, um, this document, March 2014, since then has been reevaluated, and uh, Mr. Benson will put into the record uh, the letter that states that this EA is still good um, and is still an active document that we may rely on. Um, and so um, there was a reevaluation, and that documentation um, will be in the pile of uh, exhibits we'll leave with you. So uh, again, public hearing, Fonzie issue. Here are just some, just a few, of the public meetings uh, that were held, um, warned meetings about this project um, where the public uh, had a chance to weigh in. Uh, local concerns meeting uh, back in July of 2010, alternatives presentation in February of 2011, the preferred alternative meeting in March of 2011 where that alternate one was selected, the public information update in 2013, and then the public hearing on the EA in, on January 9th of 2014. Um, and again, there's the, the EA uh, contains a full transcript of actually of that last meeting, uh, should you be interested in it. Okay, so with regard to the project process, um, there needs to be, once we get through the EA process, um, we need to do preliminary design to know where the roadway is going to go. Um, 
permits need to be acquired. Uh, we need to, once we know where the roadway is going, we need to uh, acquire a right-of-way. Um, and then from right-of-way, we go to final design, bid documents, and construction. And currently, um, we are at the right-of-way phase. So one thing that I'd like to point out is, although the list looks symmetrical, the timeline from scoping study, EA, through right-of-way is many, many years. The time frame from right-of-way through the completion of bid documents is probably less than a year. Once we get right away clear um, and go to final design of bid documents, that process will probably take less than a year uh, to complete, and then the project will go to construction. Um, so we are we are very close to that goal line of where we're starting to uh, prepare the final documents for construction. All right. So <clears throat> uh, as promised, here's a large diagram of uh, the layout that we are um, uh, talking about, the Crescent Connector. The connector is divided into two segments, Phase A and Phase B. Phase A is from Park Street to Maple. Phase B is from Maple to Maine along the current alignment of Railroad Street. Um, and so here is um, we can just point out now some of the things that we discussed in the field. Um, if, you can, if you can see um, the new public parking inside the curve of the crescent is located right here. That's where those 20 spaces are going to be located. The spaces that Mr. Kalangin was talking about in his parking lot, there are an additional 10 spaces that will be located right here. This is where the trailer and the box, the cube van, the white cube van were located. So right in here. Um, so you can see um, the other element is a curb cut and a driveway access to Mr. Clange's property. This is here. Uh, we actually, in early on in the project, had it here. He requested that we move it here. And again, it can be located anywhere along this uh, alignment <coughs> that Mr. Clange uh, desires. Um, again, Mr. Clange's property ends right there, and we'll see this shortly. Um, but it, again, the edge of the parking lot right here. So and if you may recall, that yellow mark that was near the utility pole was very close to the edge of the pavement. Well, there is the center line, the yellow line, um, and that's Mr. Clange's property to there. And then again, limited at the Knox parcel. So that's the overall view, starting on Park Street. Uh, this is the McEwing building. Um, where the Crescent Connection will depart from there. We follow parallel with the railroad tracks. And then we cross with a new crossing here, and then continue on to Maple. One of the things I'd like to point out at this point is that this crossing actually represents two very special uh, elements with regard to the railroad. The first is that it is a new crossing. So to get a new crossing across the railroad tracks is, a, is, is difficult, um, and the railroad has agreed to allow a crossing there. The other thing that makes this somewhat special is that typically the railroad requires new roadways to cross their tracks to cross their tracks at a 90 degree angle or, or on a uh, tangent if we're uh, or radially if we're on a curve. Um, in this case they allowed us to skew the roadway um, so that we could pull the roadway up and tuck it up closer to the existing railway and get into alignment much faster uh, with railroad speed <coughs> than if we'd had to come across with a curve and then essentially a, a reverse curve, and then come back again. So by being able to skew that, by the railroad agreeing to that, we were able to tuck this curve up much closer and make our destination at Maple Street. So that represents some, some kind of special consideration um, by the railroad. So the next slide is the overview of the right-of-way plans. And every color that you see uh, here uh, represents a different type of easement or right-of-way. Some are slope rights, some are permanent uh, easements, uh, some are taking. Um, and the area that we're going to focus on eventually is, is right in here, and we'll focus in on that in a second. But right now, I'd like you to recall when we were on Maple Street, and I asked you to look down Railroad Street and to observe the street and the parking. As you can see, this magenta area is, uh, is a part of the railroad acquisition. Well, presently, the railroad company owns 
more or less half of Railroad Street and all of the parking. So as a part of this project, should it move forward, um, one of the things that will be resolved is that Railroad Street now will become completely under the control of the Village of Essex Junction. Um, and the, the village will no longer have to pay fees um, for that area or be concerned about the railroad not renewing the lease uh, for the portion of the street as essentially it would close the street off um, if uh, they didn't allow uh, that second lane. So as a part of this project, that's a key feature um, that we'll talk about uh, a little bit later also. So I just, since we're out there and we looked at that, I just wanted to point out that this um, is another key part of this, of this project. Um, this is going to mean um, straightening out something that the, the village has actually been requesting the railroad since the 80s um, to be able to purchase or to take over control of this parcel. And it's only now in 2019 that the railroad has consented to allow that to happen. So, for, the, and the other piece that we're seeing here is that <clears throat> right now, all of the properties that had appraisals done um, have either signed a deed or a, a letter of uh, intent um, to close with the village and to allow the construction of the project with the exception of Mr. Kalanji's uh, property. And so um, um, all of the appraisal properties are complete uh, of the four um, and we're down to just the one. So for this evening, we'll focus on that, on that particular one. So again, uh, Park Street, Maple Street, and we're gonna start looking at this area. So here's the right of way uh, plans for uh, phase A of the Crescent Connector, Maple Street, or uh, Park Street, Maple Street. Um, we walked through this parking lot here. Uh, the building that we were looking at, the red building, was down in here, so this will help orient you. And then let's move in one more step and look specifically at the area uh, that is uh, Mr. Kalanji's holding. Here's a closer view of that drive access into the parking lot, a closer view of those 10 parking spaces, and a better view of those 20 new spaces, um, all public parking, that will be available to anybody in this area uh, who wishes to park there. Going back to the right-of-way plans, let's focus now on just Mr. Kalanji's piece. So in here, there are one, two, three, four, five, six parcels that have different types of easements on them uh, that were requested for Mr. Kalanji's. So the table uh, that you'll see in the slide uh, discusses each one and permanent and temporary. And so let's focus first on the permanent uh, easements. And we'll start right from the top and if you've got that the slide in front of you. Um, so the first is a drive easement, and that's 3,988.25 square feet. And that easement is the purple area right here. Um, no changes to the parking lot, no changes to that area. What that easement is for is to allow access from the Crescent Connector through the drive, the curb cut, so that the public might pull into one of these parking spaces. The magenta that you see above the line is actually the taking from the railroad. So all the parking spaces will be on land that comes from the railroad, and only the drive aisle will be um, uh, from Mr. Kalanji's, and again, that's the, the existing drive aisle that's there, that's there now. So that's the first, that's a permanent easement to allow access um, to those parking spaces. So the next permanent is highway, and that's 2,679.44 square feet. And that's represented by this uh, light blue uh, circular edged portion. Um, and this is where the roadway will actually be built. Um, and so this is, uh, you can actually see on your plan, uh, the edge of the road, you can see the sidewalk, and the right of way will be just outside, uh, the, the final right of way will be just outside the edge of that sidewalk. <laughs> So we're working our way down through, we'll, we'll come back to the two temporary. There are two more permanent um, easements for lighting of nine square feet and approximately seven square feet. And they're just two little bump outs here and here to allow the street lights to be located behind the sidewalk in this area. Um, so that's about 16 square feet uh, to allow the, the street lights. 
So that encompasses all of the permanent. The temporary uh, represents um, slope, which is the yellow. So these, this is uh, allowing the project to regrade that area of Mr. Clancy's property to ensure that there's um, proper transition between the roadway and, and his property uh, so that the, the grades are all um, smooth and we don't have any big step-offs uh, with grade. And then behind that is another temporary easement for construction. This is an area that uh, construction equipment and construction workers would occupy during the construction, but once the project was over, um, this area of temporary and this area of temporary, um, the village would retain no rights to that uh, after construction was done. So in summary, there's 6,684 square feet of permanent and about 2,500 or 2,502.4 square feet of temporary uh, taking that we're, we're looking at for this project. The permanent represents about 0.062 acres. So any questions before we move on? Everybody good to there? Following along? Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. So just as a reminder, as we move on to the next uh, set of history and documentation, public good, necessity, convenience, those are the three um, benchmarks, mileposts, that we're asking you to consider um, what we're presenting to you this evening and to use those as the, as the scale of balance uh, against your finding of necessity. <clears throat> All right. So in the in both the EA, the environmental assessment, and the scoping study, um, there was a purpose and need description for the project, and the purpose and need provides the target essentially in words of what this project is should achieve um, if it's going to be successful. And I, I will. Uh, I don't normally like to do this, but I will read uh, from the slide here. Um, the purpose of the proposed action is to facilitate regional travel to and from destinations south, east, and northeast of the village, as well as improve local circulation in the village center, improve safety, and enhance opportunities for ac economic development and employment growth within the village center. The need for the proposed action is based on the current levels of traffic congestion that exist within the village at the Five Corners intersection which result in extensive vehicle delays, traffic volumes exceeding capacities of the adjacent roadways, disruptions to adjoining businesses, and a high vehicle crash rate for a portion of the adjacent roadway. In addition, there are properties located within the village center and along the NECR lines, rail lines, that have not been able to be more fully developed due to lack of suitable accessibility. So purpose and need, and so the next portion of the presentation will focus on those elements of the purpose and need. Um, regional travel, uh, local circulation, uh, safety, economic opportunity. Um, and so, so the next slides will, will focus on those key elements so that you may weigh whether um, the project does in fact meet the purpose. All right, so with regard to regional travel, uh, the first benchmark that uh, was our goal, um, we'll go back to the layout plan here. Um, here is Route 2A, also known as Park Street, Route 15, Main Street. Um, presently, if traffic is moving northbound from 2A going northbound on Route 15, um, and a freight train uh, comes through uh, the village and heads toward the, the Burlington branch, this track is closed, this track is closed, and this track is closed. All of the traffic that now moves through the five corners and then out Route 15 is occluded by the train at these crossings. With the Crescent Connector in place, um, you will actually be able to bypass and continue northward um, on the Crescent Connector route. So one of the regional impacts uh, for this Crescent Connector is to allow northward and, and southward uh, traffic movement to occur even though the, there's a freight train uh, blocking the tracks um, through the village. Um, and to some extent also the Amtrak train blocking um, uh, this crossing uh, when they're parked at the station as, as the control arms are down. So that's, that's part of the, the regional impact uh, of, the, of the project. In terms of local circulation within the village center, um, 
the EA contains pages and pages and pages of traffic study, um, which are certainly available for reading, and you may have already reviewed them uh, when the EA was presented previously. I'm not going to go through uh, level of service or delays turn by turn by turn, um, but in your package you can see um, mainly there were four conditions that were examined. An AM peak, no build, so the morning, morning peak hour, if nothing gets built. The PM peak, if nothing gets built. Um, and here with this bigger slide, I'll just point out to you, you know, what you're seeing over here in terms of LOS, which stands for level of service. F, 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 E, F, F. So this is the five corners overall F. So this is in 2015, so that's actually behind us. Um, 2025 in the future, um, PMP, no build, F. Uh, so the next page, uh, this is a continuation of that sheet uh, with the additional uh, streets. So the no build summary says that if nothing gets built, in 2015 we're, we're at level of service F, and, and again, if nothing gets built in 2025, we are still going to be at level of service F. Um, and so, um, no improvement, uh, and level of service F is an unacceptable level of service uh, in, in intersection um, uh, uh, passage of vehicles. In addition, intermittent train traffic would exacerbate congestion during peak hours. So this is a direct finding uh, right out of the environmental assessment. The next table that you see is the intersection level of service with the Crescent Connector and peak build. And then again, 2015 and 2025. Again, I won't go through this. We'll get right to the summary. And peak build. Um, and then PM peak build. PM peak build continued. And the summary is that about 650 vehicles in 2015 um, would use the Crescent Connector total for both directions, reducing that amount in the five corners. In 2025, vehicles using the roadway would increase slightly, and in both in 2015 and 2025, traffic at the five corners intersection would be reduced as a result of the preferred alternative, and again, that's alternative one that we've been talking about, as evidenced in the reduced vehicles, delays, and improved LOS shown on table 3.2.4, which is what we were just looking at. So forget level of service for a moment, just step back. What we're talking about is with under build conditions, we go from a delay of 93 seconds in 2025 at the five corners to a delay of 63 seconds. So that's a 30 second um, reduction in wait times at the five corners. So whether you understand level of service E or F uh, really doesn't make any difference, but 30 seconds is a huge amount of time in the cycle time of the five corners. So in terms of, of, of local uh, impact, um, certainly the construction of the Crescent Connector will make improvements. Now, we want to be clear that the five corners, you can think of the five corners right now as a heart with a lot of congestion. And the solution for that with these clogged arteries is to put in a bypass. Um, and that's exactly what we're doing here. We're creating a bypass. This Crescent Connector is another connection that goes around the five corners, um, just like heart surgery. So will this make us uh, Olympic athletes and, and renovate our heart? No, but will it give us longer lifespan for the heart that we have, this core, this five corners intersection? Absolutely yes. All right, so another um, impact that was reviewed is air quality. Um, and how this is impacted is the faster we move vehicles through the intersection, the less impact there is to air quality. And you can actually see, um, let's move right to the 2025 table, which is on the right-hand side. Uh, there's a no build and a build, and then a percent change. And so with the Crescent Connector, we, we have improvement, for example, of CO2 of a reduction in 21%. So we have a reduction in uh, VOCs of 21%. So, you know, we're looking at, and also a reduction in the loss of energy, so of 21%. That's uh, fuel wasted uh, as vehicles are, are parked. Um, so with the Crescent Connector, we actually increase uh, air quality and reduce some of the harmful emissions uh, that we might expect from those vehicles idling for those extra 30 seconds 
at the five corners. All right, safety is another one of the categories in the needs and purpose statement. Um, clearly, we're going to reduce train vehicle conflicts uh, by creating this new crossing. Vehicles that previously had to cross at least two crossings now may only have to cross one. Um, and so anytime we can reduce the number of times a vehicle crosses the tracks, that's, a, that's an important uh, safety uh, implementation. Improve pedestrian accommodations. We have what I would refer to as the old kind of historic part of the village, which would be Mansfield Church, Pleasant, um, East Street, uh, McGregor, Arlington, Elm. Um, on one side of the tracks, we have the new residential development that takes place in where the Necky uh, educational facility was. So we've got all the new residential units there, plus the Indian Acres development. And right now, there's really no good connection uh, between those two unless you walk all the way to the Five Corners and then all the way to uh, down Maple Street or Pack Park to go to either of those. Um, people cut cross lots now. There is shorter routes, uh, but it means cutting across private property. It means potentially crossing railroad tracks, unsignalized intersections. It's not safe. And again, people are walking across private property. Uh, with this uh, present connector, there will be a direct link between Maple and Park. Uh, that will allow uh, pedestrians and bicyclists uh, to make a connection between those two routes without having to pass through the five corners. As a part of this project, all of the highway rail crossings will be improved, and they're going to be improved in multiple ways. But with regard to safety, all new signals. Um, for the first time on many of our intersections, we're going to have control gates that prevent vehicles from crossing um, while the train is on the tracks. And not only will we have gates for the traffic, uh, but also pedestrian gates to keep pedestrians from crossing uh, while a train is approaching or is crossing the, uh, the roadway. And uh, last but not least, improved street lighting. Um, as a part of the Pearl Street, both phases of the Pearl Street work, the Lincoln Street work, the Park Street work, the upgrades to the Five Quarters happened many years ago. Each of those projects has brought the street lighting up to uh, uh, its current level. And I think if you remember what uh, our, our streets looked like before those street lights were installed, uh, very dark, uh, very hard to navigate at night if you're a pedestrian. And so along with all of this new roadway will come improved street lighting, so not traffic signals. They will also do that, um, but also street lighting. So um, new signalized intersections. Those signalized intersections will be at Maple Street. They will be at Park Street. Um, and those intersections will have uh, pedestrian activated uh, signals so you can cross safely also. So that's safety. So just in summary, reduce train vehicle conflicts. So those conflicts occur here, and they occur here, uh, they occur here. We're gonna reduce those conflicts by allowing some of the traffic to avoid those crossings. Uh, pedestrian accommodations, so you'll be able to walk on a cement concrete sidewalk from Park all the way to Maple, all the way to Maine. Um, on new sidewalk or bicycle in designated bicycle lanes four feet wide. Again, that will connect you between Park and Main. Uh, so railroad crossings, again, we're going to I'll summarize those actually later. I'll give you a point by point what those improvements will be. And the street lighting, so all new street lighting from Park all the way to Main Street. The other piece that's very important about the Crescent Connector was designed and will be built to village scale. Um, and so um, much discussion occurred very early on in the project on how to make this project fit within the village. And so one of the things that we've talked about on the site walk is that the travel lanes are 11 feet wide. Typically, a uh, roadway such as this, it wouldn't be unusual to have those lanes to be 12 feet wide. Um, and we said, look, within the village, with the traffic that this will carry, we believe 11 feet is a better choice. Um, and uh, the four foot bike lanes and the five foot walk to mimic some of our other um, streets and to make the least amount of impact on our neighbors uh, as possible. And so it was designed very much to be, to fit in with the village um, and, not, and not be a part of just processing traffic through the village, you know? And I know the trustees have had this conversation before, but um, the counterpoint to this is the proposal that's, that we've seen in the past to start at the Williston line and create four lanes in both directions on Park Street to get rid of on-street parking and just become 
uh, a through way to process vehicles through our village core. Um, that concept is rejected with the Crescent Connector. So this is village scale, village speed, um, and suitable for all users, not just traffic passing through. Um, so enhanced opportunities for economic development and employment growth. So this was a, another one of the goals. Um, we had lots of input on this. Uh, this is a great letter. Uh, this came from actually Mr. Flanges himself. Um, and I'll just read here uh, the second paragraph. I believe that alternate one would be best for my property. My plans are to keep this as a rental property. And I feel that alternative one would give me the best exposure to the new road and would greatly increase the stability of my tenants with its commercial tenants on the property. So here's an adjacent landowner saying, I like alternate one. I think that's going to be helpful and make my, make my leasing of these uh, buildings to commercial tenants uh, make it more uh, stable. And he, he continues, let me know if there's anything that I can do to move this plan along as I feel this new road <coughs> should be built as soon as possible. So this is Mr. Kalanji's December 28, 2010, and this was offered up as a part of the uh, scoping study comments. You'll find a copy of this. Actually, I think we have a, a copy for in the exhibit, but you'll also find it in the appendix of the scoping study. All right, so environmental consequences to socioeconomics, kind of a big mouthful. Mm -hmm. But essentially what the, what the EA requires us to do is to look at this alignment, this construction, <coughs> and how is it going to impact or will it impact any particular socioeconomic group? Does it advantage a certain group? Does it disadvantage a certain group um, by construction? Are we looking to uh, move or have to relocate a certain a group of uh, folks in a, a certain socioeconomic group? And so the EA found implementation of the preferred alternative introduces the potential for longer term economic development by providing improved accessibility to existing underdeveloped properties that would be better positioned for future redevelopment or rehabilitation. There are no changes anticipated to population data as a result of the preferred alternative. And so here's two findings. One is we are not going to have a negative impact, but will have a positive economic impact. So again, in terms of the purpose and need, uh, here it is uh, right out of the EA uh, that has been accepted by the Federal Highways Administration. All right, so uh, back to the location that we're, uh, we're talking about. And, and Mr. Kalanji's, um, and just uh, west of, of Mr. Kalanji's property is this new crossing um, for uh, the Crescent Connector. We talked about it at length. Now this is a very special new crossing and not at a 90 degree. Um, so let's talk about what beyond the Crescent Connector will happen as a part of this project. This is a single plan sheet from a big plan set that's going to be offered up is an exhibit and will be placed on the table, which includes all of the current railroad plans and both signal and track improvement plans. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about what happens. So again, here we are, Essex Junction. We are right here. We have Maple Street, Park Street, Pearl Street, Lincoln Street. So improvements to the railroad. The very first is going to be on Central Street crossing. So this is right near the. Uh, rail depot right near our, our train station and there's going to be new concrete panels put in the surface so if you've been in the village for any amount of time you know that we've gone through uh, paved surfaces uh, we've gone through rubber mat surfaces uh, that were great when they were first installed but don't last very long um, and then in some of our crossings the new concrete panels have been used and they are much preferred they seem to hold up much better and ride much more smoothly and anyone who drives commutes on Park Street knows uh, what it's like to cross the existing uh, track crossings that have deteriorated. So, a new concrete panel, so that's the Cadillac and crossing panels, improved signals, gates, including pedestrian gates, and improved signage. So that's central. The next improvement will be at Main Street, concrete panels, improved signals, new gates, pedestrian and vehicular, improved signage, and another gate on Railroad Street. So if you may recall, if you're driving down Railroad Street toward Main, when the track, when the gates close currently on Main Street, some of the only gates that we have in the village, there's actually a clear shot from Railroad Street across to Railroad Avenue, uh, which is an unsafe maneuver. So with this, uh, with this uh, project, there'll be an additional gate on Railroad Street to prevent that cross traffic 
uh, from shooting across between those open gates on that skew angle. So that's main. On maple, concrete panels, improved signals, new gates, pedestrian and vehicular, and improved signage. Moving on, we've got the new crossing. So again, concrete panels, new signals, new gates, new signage, a whole new crossing for the village of Essex at the junction, and probably the first new crossing since the turn of the century um, <laughs> in Essex Junction. All right, so moving on to Route 2A. This is Park Street North, the crossing closest to the five corners. Again, new panels, and everybody who commutes on 2A will be thankful for that. Improved signals, new gates, improved signage, and the same for Park Street South. So um, recently the railroad removed the second set of tracks, the old tracks that went to the GE warehouse, Coco Plum, uh, Essex <coughs> apartment building. Um, and so that crossing will also get the same upgrade as all of the others. And, not to be left out, South Summit Street. So uh, improved concrete panels will be installed there. The signals there are relatively new, uh, but that crossing uh, surface, again, if you drive South Summit, you will appreciate the new concrete panels. On top of all of that, this project includes a re-ballasting and re-regulating of all of the track under this dark red line. So essentially starting uh, beyond the storage building uh, off Central, we go all the way just past uh, South Summit, and we go way out past the village um, garage area here, including the Y, all of the track will be reballasted and raised, um, and that helps railroad operation, but it also improves the signal transmission of their warning and control devices. Uh, right now, the tracks and ballast are getting into the subgrade uh, where there's a high moisture content, and it disrupts their, their uh, signals for their communication and control equipment. So all of that will be raised as a part of this project. So it's a very significant improvement just for the railroad um, as this project moves ahead. All right. So beyond the actual physical signal improvements of new signals, new signal heads, new controllers, uh, new rail signals, new cross arms, those two elements uh, don't exist in a vacuum from each other. We all know that if a train comes through the village, um, we must accommodate it with our traffic signals, and so there has to be coordination between the railroad and between uh, our vehicular signals um, to make sure that one isn't saying, yes, it's good to go, and the other saying, no, you need to stop. So as a part of this, and this is a huge project, um, and very complicated, RSG is uh, the lead on this, and they're doing a great job, uh, is the coordination of rail and vehicular signal systems. So if there are multiple possibilities, multiple combinations of logic that must be addressed, and that will be done as a part of this, and all through a single controller here at the Five Corners. Preemption for safety vehicles. All of the new signalized intersections uh, will include preemption so that emergency vehicles within the village, police, fire, rescue, uh, can, can essentially allow traffic to push through to allow emergency vehicles to clear an intersection. So preemption is a part of this project. And Park Street Q detection. So this is something that's uh, a little bit odd um, and probably not something you're familiar with, but something you're definitely familiar with is occasionally on Park Street, a fairly regular occurrence, traffic <laughs> backs up from Park Street into the five corners, blocking the Pearl Street uh, lanes. So when Pearl Street gets the green, they cannot advance because traffic is block the stop bars of Pearl because traffic is hanging out of the five corners because something has happened downstream to stop that traffic. So the Park Street cue detection will actually be a camera or a sensor uh, that will be mounted on Park Street. And as that, those vehicles start to back up toward the five corners and get to a point where they might occlude the five corners and stop traffic from Pearl, it will release southbound traffic on uh, Park Street to allow that traffic to clear and, and keep moving. Um, it won't solve all the problems, but it will at least allow um, the northbound signals, the traffic from Williston will be shut down, will turn to red, and everything green southbound will be allowed to release. So that's Park Street Q detection. All right, so costs. Uh, this is a, certainly near and dear to everyone's heart. The base project is funded 81.08% by the federal government. 
through the Federal Highway Administration, and 18.92% uh, through the state through VTRANS. There is no local match. So there is no match. The, the percentage uh, that the village must pay for the core of this work is zero. Uh, the only payment that the village will make is any time where the village wants a special provision uh, instead of a plain Jane lamp, uh, maybe something a little fancier perhaps. Uh, but the amount of expenditure from the village is very, very slight uh, compared to the overall project, which right now is currently estimated at around $7 million. Right? So $7, $7 million is the rough number we're, we're working with right now. And probably almost $2 million of that is railroad improvements. Um, so to date, $1.85 million has been expended toward this goal. So of, of the project, um, this is construction cost, plus there's the design cost. Um, so this is, this is just construction alone. It doesn't include the design phase. Um, but to date, $1.85 million has been expended. And we'll get to why that's important in a moment. All right, so consequences if the project is not built. What happens if we, we don't build this project? Well, first off, and it's not even listed here, but I want to make sure we get it on the record, is if this is not built, we do not acquire the other half of Railroad Street. So without this project, uh, we, don't, we don't finish with the railroad. The railroad does not allow us to take control of half of one of our streets. Um, and it still belongs to them, and they can do as they wish and charge us as they like for it. So that's, that's an important thing to remember. Traffic levels of service will continue to decline. There'll be no improvements in traffic uh, uh, levels of service. So we'll, we'll decline, we'll <coughs> remain at F, and that F will just get longer and longer and longer. No safety improvements enacted, so we won't have any of the safety improvements that are benefited by the new signals, uh, new pedestrian accommodations, uh, bicycle improvements, the lighting improvements, no rail improvements, uh, crossings or track, um, and no improved environment for economic development. So this. As, as the EA mentioned, this new roadway uh, sparks and makes uh, possible new economic development uh, that is not available without it. So without this, uh, a lot of economic development that would provide infill and development within the very core of our village uh, would be greatly retarded. Would it never happen? We don't know. But certainly this helps to accelerate it uh, greatly. And the village must repay costs expended to date. So uh, if we don't move ahead with this project, $1.85 million, uh, the state will come back and ask the village to repay all of those costs if the project is to be abandoned. So that's a very important feature to consider. So in summary, again, what we're asking you, the trustees, to find is that um, with regard to public good, necessity, and convenience, this project has, has met the goals of, of the purpose and need. And you can find positively under these criteria of public good, necessity, and convenience that are outlined in the statute, uh, Title 19. Questions? Thank you, Mr. Hamlin. Um, so as we go through this process, uh, I just want to be clear how this is going to work or how this okay, questions will work. Um, we will first have the trustees have an opportunity for questions. Uh, after we have finished with our questions, we will then open it up to anybody from the public who would like to have any, uh, any cross-examination. Um, again, for all of those uh, requesting cross-examination, please confirm with me whether you have or have not done the oath as I did at the beginning of the meeting. If you have not, we'll do that again. Um, if you're unsure, we'll just do it again for, for uh, making sure our bases are covered. Um, I ask that as you have questions, please make sure you address them to me. Uh, then they can be addressed to, the, to our um, witness at the time. Um, so with that, Mr. Trustee, could I just enter a couple items into the record of what I yes, please. Uh, presented? So this is an actual copy of the presentation, so you have a copy of that. This is a set of the plans as they exist to date, which of course are still in the development process. And this is a copy of a email that we received from Mr. DeForge from VTrans that uh, spells out the amount of money that has been spent to date on the project. Thank you. And just for the record, can you also state your name, please? I'm John Benson. Thank you. Um, and so, uh, again, trustees, this is just questions of Mr. Hamlin. I would open it up if anybody has any questions at this point. Um, Rick, 
Um, th and that was a great presentation. It was very comprehensive, and I really appreciate it. Um, one of the things, and I know you touched on it, but this was also part of the Circa Alternative Program. As you know, uh, Governor Shumlin um, initiated a program back, I think it was in 2012, um, for the four Circa communities, Williston, Colchester, Essex Town, and Essex Junction, to each submit a project as an alternative to, because he had decided to know, to go not go forward with the circumferential highway. Correct. And I, I, I just wonder if you could elaborate a little bit for me. Um, was that, in, in your mind, in terms of the value and all of the good things that you've listed here about this, was that like an extra set of eyes? That, was that a separate vetting process that, that, they, that, this, that the Regional Planning Commission also brought to bear on this, or so, could you just explain so, that a little bit? Yeah, so this project was actually the very first. There have been multiple CERC alternative projects. So uh, funding that was earmarked to build the, the uh, circumferential highway, again, that was the highway that would have gone from Interstate 89 in Williston uh, through uh, Mountain View Road, uh, crossing 117, um, <coughs> near the sewer pump station on River Road, um, and that would tie into what we now refer to as, as uh, 289. Um, and then that 289 loop would have gone to 2A, and then passed through the edge of the existing town landfill and paralleled uh, Kellogg Road, and then ultimately ended up in Colchester. So the, uh, the, the concept of the circumferential highway as you mentioned, uh, through a couple of administrations, um, lost favor, um, and the, this project was the very first project offered up, approved, and granted, uh, you know, given a push ahead um, uh, by regional planning and the state um, to to build this particular project as a crescent connect or as a uh, circumferential highway alternative. So yes, the genesis of this project is the is the. The terminus, the termination of, of that old project that we refer to as the circumferential highway. Thank you. And if I could just yep. uh, continue on that line of questioning. So, with that being the circle alternative uh, project, was there then additional uh, scrutiny on this project from the CCMPO or the CCRPC, depending on how that timing played out? Yes. And so, uh, the scoping studies, in fact, this project was scoped, as you may recall, actually in two pieces. Um, there was phase A that was scoped individually and phase B that was scoped individually. And then ultimately, those two scoping studies were melded together in the process. Um, but, the, but the initial process was you know, looking very closely at just one piece and then at the second piece. And so yes, I would say that this got a lot of scrutiny with regard to both funding um, you know, at the state and at the, at the regional level. Um, and, I and we have support letters, um, and I believe Mr. Pierce has uh, documentation from CCMPO that uh, they support the project uh, even at today as we speak and are still supportive of the project. I'll, I'll let him um, present that. Yeah we, yeah, we did get a letter from the executive director of the CCRPC. We also got a support letter from Genesee in Wyoming. And during the circle alternative uh, process, when it came to voting, uh, Williston, Colchester, Essex, Essex Junction, all voted uh, for this project. Groups that attended uh, most of the meetings for the circle alternative process, which was 13 months, uh, included um, Conservation Law Foundation, Local Motion, uh, a lot of uh, conservation groups, and it was a unanimous vote when it came to the end of the project. And I assume those letters you were referring to either are entered into evidence They're or in the pocket. Entered. They're all in the pocket. Thank you. Trustees, do you have any other questions? I just wanted to shift for a second and ask a specific question about the Kalanji's property. Certainly. Um, so is it safe to say, Rick, that the proposed um, Crescent Connector does not impact any of the parking spaces on his property? So the answer to that is no. Um, there, are, there is some impact, okay. and so let me, let me just point out. I don't know whether, whether you can see this. I've got the map. I've got it. Yeah. Okay. So, so right here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 
perhaps 10 spaces uh, that might be impacted uh, in terms of access. And certainly there's parking that could be reconfigured here, but assuming no reconfiguration, I would say that 10 spaces are lost, 10 spaces are gained, um, and then beyond that are the 20 spaces uh, gained across the street. So within the parking lot itself, in terms of <coughs> spaces identified and controlled, and essentially we'll call them legal mm -hmm. spaces, uh, 10 lost, 10 gained for a net uh, balance on Mr. Clangy's site. Okay. Um, Not on that, no. Okay. And, and I should say, we're, we have a two-step process, so tonight is um, the necessity hearing, and then this, the next hearing, should you uh, authorize uh, necessities, should you find positively, would be a compensation hearing, and that's exactly where that type of conversation uh, may, should take place, is, you know, impacts to, to his property and its value. Do another question, Amber, please. Um, not sure, well, it's not necessarily a question for Rick. I mean, Rick uh, pointed out um, that if we don't proceed with doing this, it, the village is responsible for $1.8 million and paying it back to the state. So I, don't, I definitely can admit that I don't know the budget that very well, but I, I'd say that we don't have the money to do that. And so my concern is what happens if? Mm -hmm. What does that mean for the village? Correct, and with our total budget in excess of $3 million, um, not by a lot, uh, that would have a, a significant impact on taxpayers, for sure. Yes. Um, so with regards to uh, the necessity of the road, um, are there other questions? And yeah, I, I want to just um, bear down a little bit more in terms of the economic development improvement uh, potential of the road. So right now, on the road, as we walked over there, it's, bas it's a dead end. It's basically, as we went in, to turn off Maple Street and go down into that property, you, it's a dead end property. There's no other way out. That's you right. have to turn around and come back out. And here, we're looking at... Um, I, and I don't. I know you probably can't. We, we, there's no way we can estimate how many cars per day are going to be going by the property now. But this will become a completely through area now. Well, we know. We know at least, and there is traffic data in the EA. And one of the slides that's actually in evidence talks about over 600 cars uh, using the this roadway in a in a peak hour. In a peak hour, yeah. over 600. So, and, and even if they're not getting off, they're, they're cars that are going by these properties. These are commercial properties, and they're going to be seeing these properties, and they have an opportunity to park or <coughs> and, have and access to these properties. And the benefit is, is <coughs> both on this side, and it, as you may recall, the McEwing parcel on the other side of the tracks also was in the same situation. They had uh, one access point brought you into the parking lot, dead end, uh, before they acquired the depot uh, farm supply parcel. Um, so again, this, this benefits all the parcels uh, along this, all the locally owned, obviously not the railroad, they're, they're the other boundary owner on the other side. Uh, but yes, uh, we believe that there is a, a benefit to the property owners. And, and I think Mr. Clangy's letter back uh, from 2010-11 uh, uh, that we put into evidence says, look, this is, this is a good thing. Um, this will bring stability to uh, my leaseholders. Mr. Hamill, with regards to uh, the traffic improvements that you had mentioned earlier, um, you were discussing about how it would be approximately 30 fewer seconds with the creation of this new road. Um, I assume is that's largely because of uh, the ability to not have to go around or to uh, not have to wait for the uh, train should a freight train come through. Was that in? Uh, so that's, that that's with part of the system, but also also taking vehicles away from the five corners, shortening those queues. Uh, so that those vehicles could get through, so that the timing now could be shortened um, to allow that shorter queue uh, to, to that platoon to make it through the through the five corners. So um, it, it benefits from a, many different ways. And again, you know, would it make the five corners a totally new experience for drivers? No, but you will certainly feel um, an improvement in the timing, um, uh, the thirty second difference. Um, it's level of service E. Um, which for an urban intersection, especially at five 
One of the particular problems of, of our community is that our intersection has five legs. So it's not a four-way intersection, um, which is a much easier intersection to deal with. So because of that extra leg, we end up with extra timing segments uh, to allow those, those five legs to operate um, and clear the intersection. So any traffic that we can remove from those legs, which this will help do, uh, will help us uh, alter the timing and, and make improvements in terms of the, of the driving public that has to drive through the five corners. And so in addition to, to that, within the, uh, the calculated reduction in wait time, was the Park Street Q, uh, I'm trying to recall the phrase that you used, the, the Park Street Q detection, was that also uh, factored into that no, reduction? No, so, so the, modeling, the modeling stands alone, um, irregardless of the, of the Q detection. So the modeling was done, uh, the Q detection was actually something that was brought up uh, by village staff and our working with the engineers and RSG as we got into the design elements um, because for us in the village, we know that there are some very specific things that occur that you might not pick up in a traffic study. And so a traffic study during, done during the summer doesn't pick up, for example, Maple Street traffic when school is in session. Um, and so we, the original counts were done uh, in non-school time. And so we actually uh, commissioned and had an additional set of counts to account for that 725 to 738 rush of people driving their cars to Lawton mm -hmm. and coming back again. Um, so that is accounted for. Mm -hmm. um, but the Q detection was, was later, um, and it, it doesn't really show up in the model. Uh, it's just a functional thing that we know as village residents occurs that we passed on to the engineers mm -hmm. uh, so they could accommodate it the best they could with technology that's available. So then there may be a chance that that reduction in wait time could actually be greater, or an increased reduction. Uh, I think what it's going to do is that the Q detection will help guarantee that the reduction in wait times will be achieved. Okay. You know, because if there's if there's if there's a Q, and the timing signals say to, for Pearl Street to release, it's green, and they can't go anywhere. Obviously, the your delay is <coughs> even though the light is green, your delay is there. So the Q detection is really going to help ensure that the projected delays are achieved. I think is the best way to put that. Trustees, any other questions? I, just one more. If, I just, if you could just elaborate. I know we, we I'm, I'm trying to follow all the traffic improvements, um, but I know because I live down on the other side of the track, so to speak, um, and I know that one of the problems in the morning are the, the traffic stacking up in Maple, down Maple Street, and then people who want to take a left-hand turn onto Park Street um, see the green light, but they can't get to it because they're stacked. So how often have we seen people jump into the ongoing traffic lane, accelerate in order to get down there and get, take a left-hand turn? Now, this, this will provide a left-hand turn onto Park Street for that. So is this going to have an impact on that? So um, if we look at uh, <coughs> the slide that I have here that shows the complete, uh, the complete roadway, um, if you look at your slides um, mm -hmm. that show, again, the, the roadway all yeah. the way from Park to Main, if you right. look at that slide, if you focus on Maple Street, one of the things you're going to note is that there is a single lane from Railroad Street to the Five Corners. So as a part of this project, the left turn lane that would, those drivers to do, as you say, mm -hmm. cross the tracks, passing illegally within 75 feet of the railroad tracks, to try to make it into that green light on the left, mm -hmm. that left will be eliminated. All those left turners will now turn left to the crescent. Um, and so uh, the queue that they'll be uh, entering is pr prior to the track, so again, much safer. Um, we won't have people standing on the tracks two cars wide now, uh, as they often do in the morning. And so that left turn lane and that, that rush to try to get to the left turn lane at the five corners will be eliminated under this project and all those left turners and as, as you know, standing in that line, the majority of the vehicles are going into the right-hand lane. It's a few vehicles to the left. Um, and so those vehicles now be able to go into the Crescent Connector and, and go left on park and avoid the five corners altogether. Okay, thank you. And, and the other thing that that does is by maintaining the curb limits, um, now we can have a bike lane um, that'll actually connect all the way from Park Street uh, to the five corners. Right now, as you may recall, if you're riding a bicycle from the pool, from the recreation facility, 
by the time you get to Bushy's Automotive, uh, that bike lane disappears. Um, and oftentimes what happens is vehicles queuing up, trying to make space for those people trying to get by on the left, encroach into the bike lane, forcing bicyclists onto the sidewalk, and it's a very dangerous uh, situation. Uh, so now that bike lane will exist all the way through the intersection, all the way to the five corners. So that improved uh, for bicyclists there also. Thank you. Are there any other questions for you? <coughs> So before I open this up to uh, comments from the public, uh, or not comments from the public, my apologies, for cross-examination of Rick Hamlin uh, from the public, I want to just remind everybody that this is for the finding of local necessity uh, in regards to public good, necessity, and convenience. This is not that compensation hearing that was mentioned before. So please just make sure that if your questions are tailored to the need of this uh, new road for our community uh, and not with regards to compensation. That can be done at another time. So. With that, if uh, anybody has any cross-examination, could you first please raise your hand so I can see how many people would like to. Okay, so two. I think mm -hmm. I'm on his, his behalf, so I just mm -hmm. want to invest. Okay. Yeah. John, would you hand me one of the slide decks? Great, thank you. So then, if you would be able to, uh, just again state your name for the record, uh, I do recall that you had done the oath in the very beginning, so we are all clear on that. Um, please go ahead and... No, I'm standing here in particular for the ease of the room. Um, I mean, I won't be there for all that long, I don't think, but I just don't want to, just want everyone to... There's line, you can stand up, you okay. stand up, okay. uh, whatever you're comfortable with there. Um, I'll, I'll sit, so I'm not sort of... Sure. Uh, <laughs> um, you earlier directed me to ask questions to you and have you direct them to Mr. Hamlin. Would you like me to do that? Yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Brown, to your knowledge, uh, have these plans as proposed tonight and as presented ever been provided to the landowners or to the interested parties? Uh, and the answer to that is uh, yes. Um, I actually met with uh, Mr. Kalanji's, uh, I believe it was in May. Um, uh, Robin, you may be able to confirm that yes. that date. Um, and at that meeting, I provided uh, a set of both the, uh, the project plans and also the, uh, the right-of-way plans. Um, specifically as to the uh, Kalanji's plan that we were focused in on earlier, uh, excuse me for looking at both of you, but I feel a bit torn. Um, uh, that plan, to my client's knowledge, has not been seen by him, nor has it been seen by his attorneys. Um, has there been any effort to distribute that plan specifically as, as it pertains to Mr. Kalanji's property on a more granular view? Go ahead. Uh, again, uh, the, the right-of-way plan uh, is, is depicted here, was, was provided, and uh, actually the deed um, for the proposed takings, which has a complete description of meets and bounds, um, all of the areas, what the, the um, takings involve, uh, has been provided to, for Mr. Kalanji's also. So that's a, a fully written description of, of, of survey level detail of the proposed taking. Um, would you be able to clarify in what format that was provided, provided to him? So in the deed, uh, in the proposed deed, um, for the for uh, the agreement with the village, <coughs> there are paragraphs uh, within that document that describe very precisely uh, the limits of the, of the boundaries, uh, just like a boundary survey that meets and bounds uh, bearings and distances for the takings. So it's a very precise description of exactly what is involved. And specifically, um, I. I apologize if you feel that I've already asked, asked this question, but I want to be very precise as to the specific layout plan to the Kalanji's. I believe it said layout plan, comma, Kalanji's earlier on your uh, presentation. Has that uh, particular image been provided to Mr. Kalanji's or to his council? So that image that we saw in the plan is, is a, a blown up image of a much larger plan that he was provided with. So uh, what we did is uh, we started in the presentation showing the complete plan which he received. Um, and then we drilled into phase A, and then we closed in a little bit more. Um, and so was he provided that blown up, very close in view of, of his particular taking? No, it was the complete plan showing all the takings, both to the south uh, and north of his property. 
So there may not have been as close a, a focus on the parking, the easements, as well as the other rights of way that were necessary for, for all proposal. of those. All of those elements are shown in the plans. They're clearly visible in the plan. Um, so at the scale that provided for that segment of the right of way drawing, so you can actually see the limit of the roadway, you can see the limit of the sidewalk. Uh, his curb cut is clearly shown um, as that's part of the uh, grading accommodation to match into his property. Um, regarding the six types of easements that you mentioned for the Kalanji's property. Um, so there's actually six separate areas. There are two different types of easements. So it's not six different types, it's six areas, two different types. Thank you. Um, there was uh, an assertion that there were, there was no changes to the parking lot made in the, in the drive easement as to the purple. Um, there hasn't been a consideration of the use of the property currently um, and the fact that um, he currently has free use of the parking lot as it is. Uh, the proposed plan forces a certain use of the property and forces a certain access to the, the roadway as proposed. Has there been uh, a consideration and an explanation of the expected access and um, easement uh, path that would follow according to the requirements of law. So um, all of the project, uh, as was mentioned in the site visit, uh, will be designed in accordance with the AUTCD. That's uh, um, the standard that the state has adopted. So all of our geometry, all of our markings, all of our signalization, everything related to this project uh, must be vetted through the AUTCD standards and guidelines. Um, with your specific question about um, use of the property. So, so currently, and, and part of this, I, I believe, is probably better held in the compensation uh, phase of the discussion, but um, uh, currently, the area that we're talking about, which is an access easement that gained uh, 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 access to the 10 new spaces that will be built at the edge of the existing <coughs> parking lot, um, that area is currently used as a travel lane by Mr. Kalanji. So. Um, could that change? Yes, if Mr. Kalanji's came to the village with a revised site plan uh, that said he wanted to relocate his parking, um, that would be something that the Planning Commission would have to review um, and ensure that it was done again in accordance with village standards. Um, because the village standards are very clear about minimum parking space sizes, also minimum travel ways within the parking lot. And so the assertion that Mr. Kalanji's can really do whatever he like in that parking lot and configure it in any way, um, has to be said with the asterisk, the caveat, that the village must approve of it and it must be done in accordance with the standards, site plan standards of the village. So um, what we're looking at is using an area that currently is a travel way to access parking spaces as a travel way to access parking spaces. So. Um, changing gears slightly, uh, I, and I um, will just briefly cite uh, a, a statute 19 VSA 501 uh, for everyone's benefit. Uh, it requires that the greatest public good be considered along with the least inconvenience and expense to the condemning property and to the property owner and that adequacy of other property and locations be considered as well as effect upon home and homestead rights and the convenience of the owner of the land. Um, I'm inquiring as to whether considerations and findings have been made on those principles. And, and I think the answer to that is yes. Um, so, so it, if I may, is this related to the findings of the local necessity? Or is this related yes. into whether this is needed within our community? So uh, the necessity, uh, we are entitled to challenge on, on a constitutional basis. Um, and so whether or not these points of law have been considered are certainly relevant to the overall finding of necessity by the trustees. Um, my next question was going to be regarding the, pl the placement of the roadway, um, and I'd be happy to, to ask those two, two questions together. So 
So, I mean, that's what we're doing here today. This is a necessity hearing. So just to be clear, there haven't been any findings made by the trustees yet on the issue of necessity. I think that's what this hearing is, is about. And Mr. Hamlin is not making findings. The, the board is making findings on this issue. So I want to make sure that what we're doing right now is, is inquiring of the witness about his particular testimony that he was presented and sort of staying within that scope. Sure, to, to focus the mention of the statute, I, I wanted to put the statute on the record as a, re, as a relevant consideration for, for this uh, trustees panel. Um, my next question was going to be the, uh, I believe it was a 20 parking, parking area, 20 spot parking area located uh, to the um, railway side of the proposed connector area. Um, and so my question is whether there has been any um, alternate uh, consideration under the engineering approach as to whether the roadway could exist uh, somewhere that did not take Mr. Kalanji's property. I'm happy to discuss that. And so um, the answer to that is yes, uh, there was consideration made. Um, however, right now the alignment that we're showing is the closest that the roadway can be pulled toward the tracks um, and, and so we're limited by two factors one is the terminus uh, which has to be the intersection of railroad street and maple so we need to enter that intersection um, so we need to end the roadway there um, and with regard to the crossing of the tracks the only way that the, the roadway could have been pulled farther up um, and 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 impact, I'll say, less of Mr. Clancy's property because even if we were to do that, there still would have been an impact to Mr. Clancy's property. Um, it would have meant that the crossing across the railroad tracks, and, and as you may have heard me testify early on, this is a very special crossing for the railroad. They allowed us to actually skew our, our crossing very slightly and not cross the tracks at a 90 degree angle or on a radial line uh, with regard to it being a curve. Um, and so we built because of that skew, we're allow that allows the curve to be tucked in a little bit more. Uh, one of the original proposals was to come across the tracks at a 90 degree angle, um, and it, it encroached much deeper and further into Mr. Clancy's property. And so this was the, the, the best compromise that could be reached with the railroad and still keep within a safe angle for crossing. Uh, because the more the angle increases between a vehicle and the railway, the more dangerous that crossing becomes because of the lack of visibility, uh, both for pedestrians and for um, uh, drivers of cars. Uh, so much so that in many locations in urban areas where trains go through, uh, pedestrians are actually required to approach the tracks, run parallel, move parallel with the tracks, and then turn 180 degrees to come back to force them to look in both directions um, because there's been numerous cases of pedestrians being struck by trains because of a skew and not paying attention to what was happening behind them. So this represents the very best compromise between minimum impact uh, on the adjacent property owners, and that's all the owners, both Knox um, and Mr. Clangy's, um, and a safe uh, crossing that uh, is permitted by the railroad and, and can be designed um, by the railway designers and feel like uh, it can be done in a safe, safe manner. Can I just add something to uh, Rick's testimony, or is that out of order? You can add as much time at the end of the question. You're talking for, yeah. Right. So at, at the very end of, of her questioning, you may. Um, I consulted Mr. Kalanji's, and that's the end of my questions for this witness. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So the only other thing I wanted to point out is that the question was about where are there alternatives considered. And as Rick pointed out, within the scoping report, other alternatives were considered, and other alternatives were considered within the EA document. And within the EA document, it identifies why those alternatives were not pursued or carried forward. So, so it's not like this is the only alternative that was considered to meet the uh, objectives of the project. And, and let me just point out for the record again um, because that first drawing with the, if you may remember the northern alternative and the southern alternative the dark blue light blue well the, the southern alternative 
uh, departed Park Street just to the south of the McEwen building, came down, crossed the tracks, and then ran in between the existing buildings uh, uh, here, um, the red building that we looked at that I pointed back to you said look along that edge, um, and then uh, joined into the current alignment of the Crescent Connector. And so with regard to impact on at least Mr. Kalanji's property, al alternative B, or the uh, uh, alternate two, the southern option, uh, would have had a much greater impact on his property um, uh, than, than the alignment selected. Thank you, Mr. Hamlin. Is there anybody else from the public who would like to cross-examine the witness? Sorry, Scott can't see her behind you. Okay. So hearing none, uh, Mr. Hamlin, thank you for being here today. We appreciate it. Thank you. You are all set. Uh, are there other, is there anybody else who'd like to provide testimony from the staff or engineer perspective? Careful standing up front. I'm taking five. Um, all the documentation that we gathered over the years with the project are in the packet with the trustee Scott. There's extra packets here at the end of the table. Uh, included everything for the circle alternative, the scoping studies, emails that had uh, gone, gone between ourselves and property owners, meetings we had. And the fact that Everything we did, all the warnings were sent out according to statute. The tickets that came back from people who signed off having received the letters and the notices. I already mentioned those and the fact that the June 6th uh, Essex reporter had tonight's meeting. Okay. Thank you, Robin. Is there anything else? Not that I can think of. Okay. Trustees, is there any? Question for the witness for cross-examination? Uh, um, no, I don't have any further questions. No. I don't either. Does anybody from the public wish to cross-examine the witness? I believe I see anybody. Okay. Thank you very much, Robin. Thank you. And was there anybody else from the staff or engineers who would like to testify today? So seeing none, we can now turn to uh, public comment and public testimony, just so I can get an understanding as to how many uh, witnesses we may have. How many people would like to provide testimony today? Okay. So then you may, you, you may like come on. That um, commentary can be from Mr. Kalanji. I'm going to be asking him some questions. Where would you like him? Uh, Mr. Kalanjis, if you would like to find a seat, uh, give us a couple moments, not to be rude, Rick. Let me clear out. Or Robin. If, Mr. Kalanjis, if you would like to come up here and join the table, um, you are more than welcome to. Uh, as far as... Okay. So then... If that's where you're comfortable standing, you are more than welcome to. If you'd like to sit next to him, you are more than welcome to. I'm going to be asking questions. I've got to face him, so um, I guess the camera would probably prefer me to be next to him so I can yes. okay. accommodate that. <laughs> yes. And then, um, Mr. Clayton, I apologize. I do not know if you were here at the very beginning of the meeting when I had uh, uh, sworn everybody in. Were you here for that portion of the meeting? I think I was, yeah. You are you confident in that, or do you want to swear in again, just to make sure? Um, I, I was here, right? He was here, but I'd be fine if you wanted just to confirm his. Yeah. If you don't mind, I just couldn't no, see him. So, if you don't mind raising your right hand mm -hmm. and just repeat after me, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you so much. Did I get that right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, you did. <coughs> if you'd like to take a seat, you are more than welcome to. If yeah. you stand, that is up to you. <coughs> well, you have me answering. Okay. Yeah. Hey, I kill myself. You may proceed. So, um, on behalf of Mr. Kalanji's, um, for the record, we are formally contesting the necessity of the plan based on its location, as well as whether or not it does need to impinge on Mr. Kalanji's property. Uh, noting that the notice was insufficient to put Mr. Kalanji's on proper notice as to where the plan would be on his property. Um, 
based on the information that he has available and that he provided to council. Um, tonight was the first time that we actually learned where the road was planned for on his property. Um, and there has been no further information regarding the requirements of state and federal law regarding traffic plans, easements, how that would actually affect, um, excuse me, not easements, but uh, traffic plans and other requirements um, on the property, uh, which would significantly impact the current use of the property, which is in fact uh, servicing <coughs> of large trucks on Bailey, Chassis, and Spring. Uh, those trucks require a very wide turning radius, and uh, the impact would be um, complete on that business as, as far as we can tell. So um, for the sake of the record, I want to make those um, objections plain. Um, and I'd like to ask Mr. Kalanji's um, some questions. Um, when was the first time that you learned what about your property would be taken? Uh, the first time, I think it was uh, about eight or nine years ago. I think we talked about that. And did you um, write a letter of support at that time? I did. Um, what was uh, your understanding of the project at that time? At that time, it was uh, relatively simple. I, I, I looked at it, uh, they had a name of uh, the uh, Crescent Lane, and it sounded like a kind of a small little road or something like that. And uh, so it sounded okay at the time. But again, that was nine years ago. Um, <clears throat> Did you understand that that plan would be taking any of the parking currently used on your property? No, I did not. Would that have changed your opinion if you had known that absolutely, it would be taking absolutely, your parking? Absolutely. Um, when you received the notice on May 24th from the town, did that notice come with any uh, clear plan regarding what the road noticed as part of the taking would be? No, I did not. I, were you uh, put under either explicit or implicit notice that there was any um, exact duplicate from the 2011 plans that you had been shown and now eight years later, the 2019 plans? It's very different from what I looked at originally. Um, you heard a commentary earlier that there really isn't a problem here because even though we're taking 10 spaces, you're, we're giving you 10 more. Do you have a response to that? Well, my response is it's, uh, it's relatively, uh, how do you say it, uh, uh, it's kind of funny. I mean, actually, the, the spaces or the, the, the places that they're taking online <coughs> are usable, okay? And the other ones, really, I don't know, they came up with that idea those eight or 10 spaces over there. I don't even know how they're gonna to get to them. Uh, but uh, in any event, the, the other uh, spaces that I have, for, especially in front of the Bailey's property, uh, they're, they're forgetting there's no way to get to them. In other words, that there's a painted space there, a parking space, but you can't get to it because the, the, the road is gonna be right up tight against it. So you need to have another space to drive there to get to the other ones, and it's just, it's almost impossible. Um, would it be fair to say that you don't agree with the assessment of the loss of your parking done by the appraiser? I don't, not at all. Uh, is there a greater parking loss than the one originally appraised according to your estimate? Yes, it is, there was. Um, regarding your tenant, uh, what will the impact be on, on your tenant? Bailey Spring and Chassis. On that one, it, it would, it, they, they wouldn't be able to function. Are they, uh, based on the, on the trucks uh, that are serviced there, would they be able to use the access to the road that's currently being noticed to you? It would be very difficult, very difficult. They, they, I, I saw one of the maps there, they only got a curb cut in there, and uh, it's not necessarily in the wrong place, but it's not in a very good space. Well, those so, so they won't be able, it would be comfortable. They, they wouldn't even be able to get to, to where they want to go. Based on your observation of the property, owning it and having your place of business there, would those trucks be able to safely make that turn onto the roadway as proposed? Not only that, I don't think that 11 foot width uh, is 
it's going to be comfortable for truckers or, or uh, larger trucks and all that. It's going to be very difficult. Would you lose, uh, lose income as a result of the impact on, the, on your property? I think so, yes. Um, the, uh, the necessity is the subject of tonight's hearing. Is it your opinion that the project, as noticed, is necessary? I don't believe it is. Do you, be believe, it is. Do you believe that there's a different location that the property could be cited? Um, I don't even think they would need it anywhere. I, I can't think of another place to, to, to put that there. But I, as, I, as the years went by, you could see that, I mean, it's, to me, it's a waste of money, the whole project. It's too bad, but it's, it's, it's not going to make anything better for Essex Junction, I don't believe. My opinion. It's the end of my questioning. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in terms of cross-examination, we will use the same process of trustees. If you have questions, uh, we will go first. Uh, from that, we will then open it up to anybody from the public who would also like to cross-examine the witness. Uh, so with that, trustees, I will turn it over to us. Does anybody have a question to kick things off with? Yep. Um, Bill, in your letter, uh, December 28th, 2010, you said you've been reviewing the proposed plans, alternate one and alternate two, for a new road connecting Park Street and Maple Street. So you were aware that this was a road, not a lane, that was going to connect Maple Street to Park Street. Correct? Well, that's a tough one, Jared. By the way, it's nice to see you. I haven't it's seen good you good to see you, too. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but isn't that, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, it's pretty clear that you were aware it's going to be a road connecting well, two streets, not a lane. Not necessarily, no. Oh. Not necessarily. I don't think it was given, uh, you know, Crescent Lane, to me, was like a little lane coming down through there. Now it's like sidewalks, uh, bicycles, uh, the whole nine yards. And remember, this was in nine, nine years ago, almost ten years ago. And I kind of actually forgot about it. And, uh, uh, and, and for somebody to bring that up now and not even make it sound like it was yesterday, no, it wasn't yesterday. It was nine or ten years ago. And uh, I just looked at it as a very small uh, operation at the time. I never gave it that much thought. Okay. And when you said, also in the letter, <coughs> that it would uh, increase the stability of your tenants, what did you mean by that? Do you remember what you meant by that? Why well, I'm not clear. The stability of your tenants, you said. Well, that. we're talking about now, well, not back in 19, not nine, nine years ago. Okay. Okay, now if it, the project is different now, if you look at it, doesn't it have that 90, 90 uh, uh, what do you call it, angle, okay? Now it's just like a, uh, a round, roundabout, so to speak, okay? And uh, if you follow me on that, okay? Uh, so, uh, no, I, I, I just, uh, or I mean, yes, it is bother, it's gonna make a big, uh, I think we're gonna lose Bailey's as an example, because I don't, I don't see how they can operate over there. And they've been there for 25 years. And uh, they're aware of it, I told them what might happen, you know, they're not too happy about it. How do trucks get into Bailey's now? Right now, they go right in uh, off from Maple Street. And how wide is that road? That's, uh, well, I don't know exactly, but I would say it's uh, probably 20 feet wide. So this is going to be uh, 22 feet wide? Yeah, so. Okay, just, just, just wanted to point that out. Well, two feet is long. It's, okay. it's a lot. But uh, it, it also means, it, it's it's just a tough it's a tough space to to get into the way the way they uh, they put in the um, the way to get into it yeah so anyway that's uh, my my opinion okay thanks Thank you. Yeah. nothing on this issue okay um, I have a couple of questions but. For the answers of them, I believe I'm going to need the assistance of uh, possibly Rick Hamlin in terms of the engineering perspective. Uh, one of the things that was mentioned is uh, that turning into the property will be difficult uh, with, with regards to uh, the customers of Bailey Springs and a truck from, from Bailey Springs. Is that what you had said? That's what I said. Okay. Um, Mr. Hamlin, can you discuss how, you, you may 
come up. Can you discuss how the road was designed with regards to uh, truck traffic that may be coming in as it relates to customers of Bailey Springs? Cer certainly. Uh, and let me let me talk about actually truck traffic in general mm -hmm. um, with regard to the project. Um, I'm going to go to the 17th, 18th, 19th slide here. So the Crescent Connector project um, has been designed to accommodate uh, trucks of, of all sizes, actually, because, again, this is a route that provides an alternate route um, between Park Street and Main for north and southbound traffic. So that at all of the intersections, um, one of the requirements, one of the things we asked the designers to implement was to ensure that a WB62, um, or which is the largest uh, tractor trailer that you can move on the road, um, can it be uh, maneuvered through the intersections. And so um, throughout the, the project, um, for example, uh, turning off park onto the crescent, um, the radii of the curb has been uh, built to accommodate trucks. Um, also, the radii at uh, Maine and at Maple have been designed to accommodate uh, larger trucks. So um, there'll be an improvement, actually, with the entrance off of Maple. And vehicles that are coming from the south that wish to go to Bailey Spring and Chassis now can actually take the Crescent into the parking lot and not be required to come to the five corners and make the 90 degree right, uh, which is actually a fairly short radius if you look at that, that plan on uh, the 17th slide in the deck. Um, so the roadway itself has been designed to accommodate larger trucks. Um, and with regard to where the location of the curb cut is, um, initially, uh, we had um, placed that curb cut farther to the north um, or to the right on this deck toward Maple. And in conversations with Mr. Clanges, he uh, suggested or asked that we move it further to the south. Um, anywhere along that route, once we clear the tracks um, and have a safe distance away from the rail intersection, um, that curb cut could be located. Um, and so if Mr. Clangies would like it moved uh, southerly or easterly along the perimeter of the uh, uh, Crescent Connector alignment, um, it can easily be accommodated. Um, right now, uh, based on the imagery that you can see, the trucks, there are uh, the, the entry points to Bailey Spring and Chassis are on, uh, would be the west face of the building. So that's, that would be the uh, face of the building toward Park Street. Um, and uh, currently, those trucks come in and circulate through the parking lot to gain entrance. Um, and right now, there's parking spaces in front of those doors. Um, and so uh, what we're proposing would be um, no different in terms of the parking lot circulation for truck access um, to get there. And we certainly would be more than willing, uh, as a part of our design work, to ensure that whatever single unit, and I'm, I'm assuming that most of the Bailey Spring and Chassis truck work is a single single unit trucks, mm -hmm. um, that uh, we can put turning templates in the parking lot and make sure that they can uh, maneuver in and out. But if they can move in and out of the doors now and clear the parking spaces that are there, uh, we believe that they can maneuver throughout the rest of the parking lot to get back to where the Crescent Connector entrance is. And again, that could be located wherever Mr. Clangies would prefer it to be. Okay. along the alignment. Thank you. Um, another, another, and I believe the uh, last question I have that relates to uh, you, Mr. Hamlin. Um, one of the comments was about the uh, difference, the plans being very different from the original plan to uh, what we have in front of us. Um, the original plan is from the scoping study, so the one with the uh, two shades of blue with the red dotted line. That came from the Essex Junction Crescent Connector Road final scoping study. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, that one, I believe you said before, uh, the darker blue northern alignment was preferred because it would have less impact on the properties. Uh, and in addition, from the final layout, I believe you said this final layout even further reduced the impact onto uh, the current property. Is that correct? Yes, and the 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 scoping study schematic, if you, if you look at that, that's figure one from the scoping study that's in the slide deck. 
Um, if you look at how the crescent connector in the northern alignment crosses the tracks, you'll see that that crossing is, is at a 90 degree or radially uh, along the radius of the curve of the track. Um, so that, that alignment would have driven the roadway deeper into Mr. Kalangi's parking lot and then a turn accommodated uh, that would direct traffic toward Maple Street. With the skew, we pull that bow, that 90 degree bend as you cross the tracks toward the Kalangi's property, we pull that back and have a turn of much less than 90 degrees and are able to tuck that corner uh, up much closer um, to the railroad tracks and further away from Mr. Kalangi's property. So um, in concept, uh, is, is our current alignment different um, than this alignment? And again, it's schematic. And I would say, yes, it is, in that we pulled it further away from Mr. Kalangi's property by able to be, being able to have that skew mm -hmm. uh, intersection as we cross the tracks with the new track crossing. Okay. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hamlin. Those were all that I had. Um, did either of you have any questions? No. Okay. Um, I actually don't have any other questions myself. Um, is there anybody from the public that would like to that would like to uh, have any cross examination of the witness before they are dismissed? I have one more follow up question for Mr. Clint before we conclude. Yeah, I'll make sure to get back okay, to you. Thank you. I don't believe there are any hands raised. Okay. Yes. Uh, Mr. Clint, based on the testimony that you, testimony that you just heard regarding um, the access to uh, Bailey's. Uh, would even more of your parking be impacted to allow uh, trucks to enter and uh, exit the building based on uh, the plan just, just described? Yes, they do. Based on the plan. This one, oh, this one here? No. Nope. Based on the, on the layout plan, I believe slide 17 was referenced. Um, the plan as referenced um, allowed trucks to enter and exit the property, but would impact, um, but would that in fact impact more of the parking because you'd yes. have to allow access? Yes, it will. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other cross-examination okay. from the follow-up question? Does anybody in the public have any other cross-examination of the witness from the, uh, from the public? Okay. Hearing none, thank you for, for coming. We appreciate your time today. And just to recap, there is nobody else from the public who wished to come forward to provide any testimony today? Okay. Mr. President, could I ask uh, that you just review the process of where we are right now and what's going to happen next in, in the steps? With regards to tonight's meeting? Mm -hmm. Yes, tonight's yes. meeting and further steps. So from here, what we will do is, as uh, we have received all public comment and all testimony as of today, what we are going to do in pursuant with uh, the process of a public hearing for finding of a local necessity is uh, the trustees, our legal counsel, and our municipal manager will enter into what is called a deliberative session. So that way we may privately discuss uh, and deliberate uh, the next steps from here. Um, after which, uh, we will then uh, share what came out of that, any decisions that are made, um, and for the next steps. You know, check the legal counsel. Didn't make anything more. Great. Yes. Yeah. So now uh, that there is no other testimony to be received, I will now close the public hearing. I will now close the uh, public hearing for the finding of local necessity, and close all the evidence that, uh, for today's hearing. So, with that being said, we shall now move into a deliberative session. Uh, in which the trustees, our legal counsel, and our municipal manager will deliberate uh, tonight's session. Everybody else, uh, you may you may enjoy your day. <laughs>